Tech is a bi-weekly podcast exploring the intersections of technology and ministry. It is part of the podcast network sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Our show today is hosted by Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Welcome back to Wells Tech, everybody. This is episode 694, and we're recording it on Tuesday, November 15th, 2022. My name is Martin Spriggs, and this is a show about technology and ministry and where those two intersect. Joining me as usual, uh, I believe uh, from beautiful Mankato, her background's always the same, so it's always hard to tell, <laughs> but uh, I think she's in Mankato these days. Uh, Sally Draper. Hello, Sally. Hello, Martin Spriggs, joining you from beautiful North Mankato. North it's Mankato. a different place. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Even though it's um, not really north of Mankato. No, that's just to throw you off a little. We, <laughs> right. we do stealthy things like that here. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Yep. Happy to be here. And it is a tad bit more beautiful these days, especially if you like the color white. Yeah, that's We've true. We've got some snow on the ground. So uh-huh. welcome to November. Yep. Also joining us, Rachel Feld, professor at Martin Luther College. And Rachel uh, is our semi-regular classroom technology correspondent, joins us every month during the school year or every other month during the school year. And um, she doesn't have her sidekick this time. Uh, he's uh, we, in the biz. We call him on assignment someplace else. <laughs> Basically, he couldn't join us. But Rachel uh, is uh, is up for the task, I'm sure. Rachel, where are you these days? Um, I am in New Ulm, Minnesota, which is kind of north-ish of kind of North Mankato-ish. <laughs> I don't know. We don't believe in cardinal directions around here, <laughs> um, right. but we are also getting some lovely snow, which I really love. Uh, it's fun with the first snow on campus because you can tell all the freshmen who have never seen snow before are outside right. and they've all got their phones. I saw someone like video chatting their parents, telling them how cool the snow was. So mm-hmm. that's kind of fun. It's interesting. You're talking about college kids. And I guess I knew this, but it never occurred to me. My new commute since we've moved goes right through Carroll University, which is in Waukesha. So I I drive right through the heart of their campus. And every single student is walking down the street with their cell phone in front of their face. It is amazing that they do not get run over. Um, it is, it is truly amazing. There's not one that does not have their cell phone out. So I guess that is the generation that we live in. I sound very old by bringing it up probably. And I was going to say, are you supposed to be able to walk places without looking at your phone? (laughs) I don't know the last time I did that. Right. I was just going to ask the same thing, Martin. I suppose you never look at your phone when you're walking. I do. Uh, I probably do. But Maybe so. <laughs> not everywhere. Hi, Jen. We're all we're all in the hip crowd. Okay, Sally. What are we going to talk about today with well, uh, we, uh, with our friend Rachel here? Yeah, we started off um, our last show with Rachel and Jason Schmidt, who's normally able to join us, but not here today. Uh, Rachel and Jason and I talked about the Incredibles of EdTech, a series that we were starting. Um, and we hope to highlight throughout the school year um, just different tools and um, frameworks and functionalities that uh, make education technology um, easy to work with and helpful for teachers and students and parents and everyone involved. And so uh, last time we focused on Mr. Incredible, that foundation, that super strong guy. And our focus was on instructional design, the the framework that you use um, to carry out education and especially implement technology um, where it's appropriate, that kind of thing. Um, This week, we're shifting over to Mrs. Incredible, better known as Elastigirl. And uh, she is the ultimate of versatility. Elastigirl can stretch herself in so many different ways. And um, if you're an Incredibles fan, you know what I'm talking about. And so to parallel that, we wanted to talk about flexible ed tech tools. And uh, we thought it was 
would be a great discussion if each of us just kind of picked one that we feel like is kind of a go-to jack of all trades, Swiss army knife, super versatile tool that you can make use of in um, education settings. So maybe Rachel would be a great place to start if you want to bat lead off for us, Rachel, and tell us about something versatile that uh, educators can't live without. Absolutely. So um, flexible tools are really important in the classroom because you, as a teacher, you spend a lot of time trying to get students to know the different buttons and how do you log in and uh, how do you save and what, you know, what features are there. And that can be really time consuming. And the more time you spend on those features of the tech tool, the less time you're spent spending on your actual lesson objectives. And when it all comes down to it, it's the lesson objectives that are most important in the classroom. So we kind of want to have that tech to almost disappear at a certain point. And that's why using flexible tools can be really great because the more you use them, the easier they are to use and the more they disappear. Uh, so my favorite flexible tool and uh, I will gladly fight anyone who thinks that this is not the best flexible tool ever. Um, I'm a little sad Jason wasn't here because I don't know what he would have picked. And then we could have argued about it and that would have been fun. Um, <laughs> but my favorite tool uh, by far is uh, Google Slides. And um, it is, I if I had to pick a desert island uh, tool, um, now, how one would teach in a classroom on a desert island is beyond me. And, you know, I need an internet and things like that, too. <laughs> if I only had one tool to teach with, uh, it would be Google Slides, because I would argue it can do pretty much anything that you need it to do in the classroom. So I did uh, put together a, huh, funny enough, slide presentation for everyone that I'm sure Sally will uh, link to in the show notes. And I'll share my screen for those of you that are watching, but I will also uh, do my best to narrate what you're seeing in case you are just listening along too. So um, first thing to think about, let me, what's that button? Oh, that went way too big. Mm -hmm. Very large. Yeah, you have to do an exit full screen. There we go. Then. Yep, I got it. Don't you worry. I know how to work Google Slides. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so first would be some slides add-ons that are really awesome um, that just kind of give your Google Slides an extra oomph. One of my favorites by far is called Pear Deck. And Pear Deck will make your slides interactive. So you could present it to your students and be asking questions during uh, your slideshow. Um, those can be open-ended questions. They can be multiple choice questions. They can be drawing questions. Uh, so it really can work at pretty much any grade level, um, even down to the little ones, maybe not like super little preschool, but first and second grade, you could definitely start with that where you could uh, give them an image and tell them to circle all the things that start with A or something along those lines. Uh, so Pear Deck really makes Google Slides more interactive within the classroom. When you're building your slides, a couple other ones that are great, uh, Slides Toolbox, Icons by Noun Project, um, Unsplash, those will help you add some additional images to your uh, to your slides. Um, and then Lucid Chart will help you add diagrams. And another one, um, which is Equatio, will, if you're teaching math that needs the fancy equations, help you type those equations into your slides as well. Then there are also some really great websites for slides templates. So this is another area that um, Google Slides really shines. And one of my favorites is Slides Mania. And it's uh, been selected as it's got some awards there. But what I really like about this one is it has a whole section that's just for education. Mm -hmm. They also have some that are created by teachers and for teachers. 
But the education ones go way beyond just a uh, slide design for like a presentation. We've got games that you can play. Uh, there, there's a template for guess who. Uh, there's a temple or a template for like a wheel of fortune type game or um, all sorts of other games in there that you can add your own content to it or students can add their own content to it and um, then play some fun review games. There are choice boards. So when you're uh, finishing up a unit and you want them to have some sort of, your students have a cumulative project, but you want to give them some options in what they're doing. These are some templates that will let you create that in a way that students can kind of have all the pieces right in that slide deck and uh, make their choices about what they're going to do. Uh, we've got planners and notebooks. We've got manipulatives. Um, we've got, there's a whole happy series about mm -hmm. for different, uh, different holidays and just all sorts of just really fun stuff that um, it's already created for you. You just have to add in your own content. So those are some of the templates I love. Another thing that I love doing is um, making different uh, different uh, different slide presentations for students with locked backgrounds. So this is an example of actually a math worksheet, and um, I made this for a friend during COVID. It is a Saxon math worksheet. What's fun about this is that the student cannot uh, change the background at all. So they can't go in and edit the question to make it easier or harder or anything like that. And the way that's done in a Google slide is you go to the background button and then you can choose an image as your background. And so in this case, we took a photo of the uh, math worksheet and then you can make the, um, then you make that the background and it's all in there. And then I just added also some, uh, some instruction boxes in red and then places for them to put their answers in blue. Okay. And so that can be one way to make something that maybe isn't digital, uh, easily digital, digital if needed. Another one that I enjoy, I made a 10 frame for students. And uh, anyone who's taught lower grades knows all about a 10 frame for um, adding and subtracting. So this particular one, again, I used, I made the background with the 10 frame and uh, we can make our adding sentence here. And then if you go to file, you can go to download and one of the options is to download a JPEG or a PNG file of your current slide. So you do that and then you come back and you make that the background. Mm -hmm. So now on this slide here, I can't make any of these things move or disappear no matter how much I click, but I did add some red and blue counting chips and those I can move around as I want. I could also add text boxes here so that they could put the numbers in or I could make number cards for them to drag and put in there. Uh, something very similar would be this CVC word building. And again, I did the same thing. I started with, uh, if you're not an elementary teacher, a CVC word is a consonant vowel consonant word. So a, a three letter word that um, is a good place for beginning readers to start. So I've got my little letter frame here and I put a picture of a cat above it. And then I have all of these um, picture, all of these letter tiles. Now what's fun about the letter tiles is that the students can't edit the letters. And that can be a little tricky because if I see this one here, they could edit that letter. 
and then students are going to accidentally click on it and then they're going to change it to a letter and then they won't have the letter and then it'll be you know not the best day for everyone so mm -hmm. what you can do is you take your little text box that you've got and then you have a transparent box you put that right on top of it so you can't even tell it's there and then you select them both and you group them so now that transparent box is locking that letter in there so it can't move at all. Hmm. Tricky. And then I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> then you can just change out this picture for other ones and you can have as many um, down there as you need. And you can also create as many letter uh, boxes as you need. Also, you can store the letter boxes outside of the slide. You can use that as kind of a workspace so it doesn't all have to be jammed on top of your slide. Hmm. Um, another one, oh, not that button. Can do a word sort, which is the same type of thing where I've got my image for a background. And then for these words, what I did is um, made my little word, you, you've got your word box, your text box, and then I did the same transparent box and I just put that right over top of it and uh, grouped those together again. So again, they can't edit the word at all. They, they can only move it to whatever spot it's in. I did the same thing with noun verb identification, adverb search. Feel free to make copies of these when you get the links in the show notes. Um, and use them however you would like. One uh, important thing to know is that as soon as I would put the slides into full slideshow, the clickableness of it goes away. So that's kind of a bummer. Um, so it doesn't work like in full screen slideshow mode. What you can do, however, and something Google has recently added, if we go to the view menu, there is now an option to turn off the film strip, which is the uh, list of all your slides on the side. And then on the top of the menu, there's a little up arrow in the right. And if you click that, most of your um, menus will go away. And you can also click, there's an option to hide the speaker notes. So if I do all of that, I really get a much cleaner uh, looking place for students to work with less distractions. Nice. Rachel, I'm assuming this would be a nice experience on an interactive uh, display panel. Absolutely. You know, in the front of the room Absolutely. where the, the kids or you can actually touch the, the items and drag them around. So it's yeah. not a mouse driven exercise. It's a, it's a very tactile experience. Exactly. And for some of these, like the 10 frame one, um, the teacher might have their copy up on the board and then the students might have their copy on their devices. Now, I will say, um, as any good teacher would say, don't get rid of the manipulatives, like still let them have the, the actual 10 frame, their actual little circle counter things. Um, but this can be especially helpful if students need to do work at home because those uh, those manipulatives might make it home, they might not, parents might not quite know how it works. And so if your classroom website had a list of these available uh, for students to use at home, that could be helpful for them in getting their homework done. Very cool and demos, Rachel. There are also, I told you guys I could talk about Google Slides for a real <laughs> long time. Um, I promise I'm almost done. We're going to have to put uh, her on there, the clock, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Uh, there are some really great uh, bloggers who write about um, Google Slides as well. And so I have linked to a couple of those. Um, Eric Kurtz from Control Out. Alt Achieve is one of my favorites. He's got one about how you can insert audio into, um, into a Google slide and then have a clickable audio button. That can be really helpful for uh, new readers or perhaps you're in a, 
uh, learning a second language and you want the students to hear that second language uh, so they can listen to it right within the slide. He's also got a couple of uh, build a snowman or disguise a turkey, very <laughs> apropos for the current uh, the current holiday season. Uh, then he's got some for making um, interactive quizzes, a choose your own adventure book. You can do a stop motion animation in Google Slides. You can create eBooks in Google Slides. Um, you can do interactive notebooks. You can even create an app, which is pretty cool. Uh, if we look at this example here, it's actually a uh, classroom app. And it's so you can load it on any, uh, you could load it on a mobile device, you could load it on a Chromebook. And here it's just got some simple links so that students can see what's for breakfast and lunch or they can see what their homework is. Um, so something as simple as this could be pushed out to all your students and they could have their very own classroom app that they could even work to keep up to date. Uh, there's a couple more in there, but I will leave those for everyone to peruse through on their own. Uh, and that is why Google Slides is my favorite of all time. Very nice. Ever. You could MacGyver it to do almost anything, it seems yeah. like. I'm pretty sure, yeah. One of the things you kind of demoed at the very beginning when you showed the Saxon math worksheet is the fact that the screen dimensions or the slide dimensions can be set to anything. So oftentimes we think of a, a slide as being kind of a landscape four by three or whatever. Um, but you have the ability to set those to anything. So you can set them to eight and a half by 11 inches. And then these things that you're designing can be um, exported as PDF or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, so there's, there's versatility there as well. It's almost like a, it's almost like a desktop publishing software of the past or whatever. Yeah. If you're looking to create uh, in any of the Google, if you're sticking to Google tools, and mm -hmm. want to make like a newsletter or a newspaper or something. Google mm -hmm. Slides is your best bet. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I need to do a quick screen share just because um, we have sent you to a desert island in the past with with our buddy, Jason. I just wanted to remind you that <laughs> you've true. been there and somehow you survived it. And so there must have been internet in that coconut tree or something. <laughs> I don't know. But you, we, we've been there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my turn with a versatile tool, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes sharing about one of my favorites, and that's Trello. Um, and maybe I'm coming at this from either um, an older student's perspective or from a faculty um, school office kind of perspective, because Trello is a great tool for planning things. I guess that would be my number one way of describing it. I, I actually Google it because um, what what it is, is it's kind of hard to pin down because it's so versatile. Um, I found that it was a virtual yellow stickies on a whiteboard experience and you can use it collaboratively. So multiple people can be doing this yellow stickies on a whiteboard experience. Um, it's web-based obviously. Um, and then just kind of unlimited ways of tagging things and labeling things and assigning people to task and that kind of thing. And if that wasn't enough, Trello offers a lot of different plugins and things that can even extend it even further and integrate it with other tools that you maybe use. And so again, I was kind of thinking faculty use, like you're planning for Lutheran Schools Week or something like that. Maybe you're, um, you have a Trello board for your school newsletter and every week people add to list and share their content that they want put in the newsletter and Trello is kind of the hub for how all that gets coordinated. Or maybe you're undertaking something like a curriculum review or technology planning or whatever it may be. And Trello is a really great tool for doing that. Uh, if you're a longtime Wells Tech listener, maybe you've heard of Trello before from Wells Tech. We've spent a lot of time um, showing all the capabilities that exist there. We have some uh, sample boards out there that you could play around with, including one that uh, Julia Wagon Connect put back, put together way back in um, like 2015 for a conference we were hosting. And it shows things like labels and 
um, due dates and checklists and all the different things that can be part of a Trello board. So definitely uh, poke around through the links um, that we provide for you. In addition, Trello offers great help and they have a really fun blog actually where they do a great job of applying all the different things that it can be used for um, and giving you ideas of ways to make use of Trello. Um, again, described as a whiteboard, it kind of is a, a, a web page that you can assign a background to. You make list to get things organized on your Trello boards, and then you um, add cards. And those cards, like I said, they can have labels, they can have content, links, and things. Um, they can also have discussion. And as you collaborate with people, you can at mention them on the cards, and they get notified of that kind of um, Facebook or Slack conversation like. And so all the things related to that. And then one of the things that I really love about it, especially if you recycle your events year after year, like there's going to be a Lutheran Schools Week next year, you can bring up that Trello board. You can easily clone it and just start making changes from what you did the year before. Um, and so lots of versatility there. So I thought it fit well with the concept of uh, Elastigirl and kind of a one-stop shop to meet a lot of different needs. Uh, so check it out. That's Trello.com. For us, Sally, Trello is pretty battle tested. We've been using uh -huh. it for absolute years, and um, there'd be a number of us that would be completely lost, you know, if we <laughs> if we had lost access to our Trello boards, and uh, not just for day to day operations, but uh, going back in time, just kind of getting a, a review of what went on, how we got mm -hmm. things done, the mistakes we made. I mean, we use it for for so many things. Uh, I use it personally as well for, for to-do lists and uh, summer travel plans. And when we were moving this past summer, we had uh, a Trello board for each house, the one we were selling and the one we were moving into and um, just uh, 101 applications, I think not just for, for education, but uh, all, all walks of life. It's just a good, f and that's kind of the, the theme of the show, just a super flexible tool you can kind of make it do what you need it to do it do, maybe doesn't ride to rise to the level of google slides but it's it's a it's a very close second <laughs> and you know i definitely could see students like i said upper grade oh, students yeah. especially making use of something like this to organize group projects mm -hmm. or um, large papers that they're working on that they're doing research on or whatever the case may be um, certainly a great tool to introduce students to to help them in their future uh, college and work life because it's definitely uh, it's adopted widely so it's something mm -hmm. that they very likely might see in their future so yeah, for sure all right I think it I think uh, the ball is now in my court and uh, I am going to talk about uh, a a screen casting tool called Screencast Omatic. And there's a whole kind of uh, group or collection of these kinds of tools. And uh, Screencast Omatic is just uh, one in, uh, in a whole series of, of different tools that operate pretty similarly. But if you're not familiar with a screencasting tool, it essentially allows you to record both what's on your screen, what's on your microphone and what's on your webcam. So you've got three inputs. And then there's also annotation tools and those kinds of things. And essentially you uh, click the record button and uh, you tell it what portion of your screen or what uh, browser window, or do you wanna record the entire screen, what microphone to use, what camera to use, uh, and away you go. And um, normally these are shorter videos. You don't want to record a, an entire documentary, you know, using a screencasting tool, but um, I've seen that done too. Uh, shorter is better. But anybody that is teaching in a flipped classroom kind of setting or just kind of an asynchronous model where you're trying to uh, teach a lesson, uh, you can easily do that. I use this obviously uh, for the class that I teach on web page design, where I'm de demonstrating something, but on the on the flip side, I'm also uh, asking in in some cases the student 
to use the tool as well to record for me the process that they're going through. For instance, in my web design class, if they're stuck, especially on a, a, a problem that they can't solve, it's far easier for me to watch them you know, do the things they're doing and, and watch some of the errors that they're making and then respond usually with my own screencast saying, no, you did it this way, but you should have done it that way rather than, you know, typing uh, 10 bullet points and asking them to, to follow along and try and, and get that right. Um, there are many other applications. Screencast-O-Matic happens to have an educator's virgin, version and, um, so obviously you can record your lecture and those kinds of things or your, or your hands-on, but they also, uh, with a certain level, uh, and it's fairly inexpensive, they also can incorporate quizzes, um, you know, more interactivity built into your lesson. So true, true false, um, multiple choice, short answer questions, polls, ratings, those kinds of things to, to engage the student in the screencast. And like I say, a lot of the tools do that. Camtasia does that. Uh, another tool is Screencastify. Uh, they have similar features like that, um, but super flexible in that it can record anything that you're doing. And also you can build that into your lesson planning where you're asking students to deliver um, their assignment via a, a screencasting tool. And one of the neat things about these is that they're usually fairly easy to set up. Uh, Screencast-O-Matic, for instance, uh, works on Windows, works on Mac, works on Chromebooks, works on iOS, works on Android. So whatever tool the student or you as the teacher or instructor are using, there's typically a version for it. And it's usually easy to get set up. Once you record it, you can edit it. And uh, perhaps the best part about it is with a single button press, you can upload it to the Screencast-O-Matic server, uh, or you can uh, upload it to Google Drive, or it's super easy to get the videos off of your computer onto a more public place where they can be where they can be added. I notice on their site right now, they've got a 40% off for the holidays sale. Uh, at least Screencast-O-Matic does. Um, and there's all kinds of, uh, another great thing about all these tools, I think, is that they've got great tutorial videos. You can go either on YouTube or go on their site and see all kinds of ways to use this in all kinds of settings, whether it is in a, um, uh, a grade school setting or high school or professional setting. Um, they have all kinds of examples here and uh, super easy point and click kind of operation. So this is very approachable, I think, for almost any teacher if they just, uh, if they, even if they're, if they shy away from technology like this, it's really not hard. You just need the, uh, you know, in fact, fairly modest equipment to use these too. You don't need a souped up computer to, to make these things work. If it works on a Chromebook, it'll work on almost any place. So that's a, a tool that I think is super flexible in, in all kinds of um, settings, uh, depending on, it, regardless of, of what you do. It looks like it'll even do screen recording from a mobile device, an iPad or an Android. Yeah, so. they've got iOS and Android. That's um, pretty cool. Resources as well. So mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, in this day and age, I think um, video interaction with students is becoming kind of an expectation almost. I know um, my son just finished Sim, setting up his very first catechism class, and he was looking for ways to to flip that in essence, to give them some video content in advance of the lesson that they're going to be studying. And so um, it's everywhere and these kind of tools make it really easy. So good stuff. Rachel, is this something that is discussed at the MLC level or as you talk with your students, is this a, a technology that is um, taught, recommended, discussed? What's What's going on over there on the Hill related to screencasting? Yeah, um, well, during COVID, we definitely fell in love with screencasting, <laughs> um, taught a good number of professors how to use Screencast-O-Matic or Screencastify uh, to help with their online courses. 
Um, but we also do in the Teaching with Tech class, we talk about screencasting and uh, especially for the idea of student assessment. Uh, I have some cute example videos of little kids explaining their math thinking or, mm. uh, you know, reading a book out loud that they made in Google Slides. Um, and things like that can can just be really, especially the math one. I can count so many times when a student handed in a paper that was all completely wrong and I had no idea why. But if I had had one screencast of the student explaining why they did what they did, mm -hmm. I would have had a much better grasp on uh, their understanding. Looking so over their virtual a, shoulder. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Super useful tool. Neat. All, All right. right. I think that's going to end our segment. Um, Sally, we have something, I have something here called bonus on the <laughs> show notes. <laughs> so when we were planning, we said we each can come up with an idea of something versatile. That'll be great. And then somebody somewhere along the way said, we should probably talk about <laughs> link shorteners uh, just to kind of go along with um, this discussion, making everything you work with versatile, basically giving people easy links to guide their students, their faculty to some of these tools, and that kind of thing. The one that floats to the top for us is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y. Um, and there you can create a free account and give any long, ugly URL or even a short, not so ugly URL. Um, give it, type that in there uh, or copy paste it in there. And I will do that in just a second. And then uh, it will create a short link for you. You can also turn on the option to generate a QR code. That's, and, yeah, that's a recent feature. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty nice. And QR codes are super easy way to get people with devices that have a camera uh, landing in the place you want them to. And then they actually, uh, I wasn't familiar with this until I logged in, but they have something new called link and bio. Um, it's perhaps a premium feature, um, but it allows you to kind of create a master page with your favorite links and they'll help you do that. They'll generate that for you. Um, it, I assume if you're a premium customer, but just like that, type in a link um, and you get a bit.ly, it's bit.ly slash some um, garbly goop, but it's really short. Um, you can actually edit that and you have the ability to customize um, that um, link. And then you can save it so it's something even more reasonable for your users to make use of. So bit.ly mm -hmm. slash Google Slides or whatever it is that you're trying to get them to. Um, and then when you save it, that link is available. And anybody that types it, it'll resolve to the longer link um, that you wanted to send them to. Yep. So just to use your analytics along with that, too. Uh, so you can true. actually go back and see how many people have clicked that link that you created. Mm -hmm. Great for putting in newsletters, whether that's a school newsletter or church uh, church activity sheet or whatever it is, because uh, mm -hmm. some people are taking that paper home and uh, the uh, the only way to actually get them to a you know one of those ugly URLs is to, to shorten that <laughs> and just make it super easy for them to type it in on their phone or their uh, um, computer or scan that uh, QR code. So. Pretty cool. Awesome. All right. A uh, little bonus goodness there for you. Ministry mm -hmm. resource time, Sally. What do we've got? What do we have in that category this week? Well, um, we wanted to make mention that the Martin Luther College course offerings for spring of 2023, particularly in the graduate studies and continuing education area, um, are posted online. And you can sign up now, folks, for uh, different classes that are being offered. They have them actually organized by different areas. So if you're interested, for instance, in educational technology, um, you can click on that and see that Martin Spriggs is teaching a brand new class on enhancing ministry with technology 
technology. We may have heard about that this summer, Martin. Oh, yeah, we um, will. It's actually going to happen. So if you want to take Martin's class, you can go there and click the register now button. There's a variety of classes offered. Um, some of them, like I said, fall in the graduate studies area. Um, some of them are related to micro credentialing, where you can just get a really focused look into um, different topics. Um, there's special education, there's an evangelism certificate. It's all over the place. You have lots of options. Um, I think they're even offering American Sign Language for the very first time in the spring semester. So definitely uh, surf on over to that link. We'll have it in our show notes and you can get engaged with Martin Luther College and their spring course offerings. Lots of good stuff there. Rachel, are you teaching this spring as well? I am not teaching this spring. I'm teaching right now. Okay. So uh, in the spring, I'll be writing a dissertation. I hope. Oh, good for you. Excellent. Then we have to call her doctor. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, you do. <laughs> if she right. ever gets that done. She's been talking about this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a lot of talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm sure there's a, there's a light at the end of that tunnel. All right, let's move on. <laughs> Let's move on to our picks of the week. If you haven't had enough pick goodness, we're going to give everybody a, a second swing at a pick this week. So, Rachel, what do you got? All right. So my pick is actually kind of a combination of two separate things that have uh, really made my life a whole lot easier as I've um, been creating things for online courses one thing that can kind of get a little bit frustrating is how many repetitive tasks there are. Um, like I'm currently making um, reading guides for chapters in a textbook and trying to link to uh, different resources and different uh, research articles. And it's just a lot of the same types of keyboard strokes over and over again. So I decided I was going to be kind of like a gamer and get a stream deck. Um, Stream decks were actually created for gamers so that you can, or uh, YouTube celebrity type people, so you can like manage all of your stuff on, I don't really know how you would use it as that. But what it is, is a little keypad. And um, the one that I have had, it has, is three by one, two, three, four, three by five. So I've got 15 little uh, options for buttons. And you can program using their um, using their software. You can program the buttons to do pretty much anything. Um, so, for example, I have programmed one of the buttons to uh, launch to start my car with the remote start because it happens to have that integration. So I can just press a button and there it goes. Um, I've got one that will bring up um, my email, a couple of other things, but where I really found some great productivity hacks is when I then combined this stream deck with a um, utility called Keyboard Maestro. And what Keyboard Maestro does and I'm sorry, but this one is just for Mac. Um, I'm sure there are Windows alternatives. I haven't looked. <laughs> there uh, are, yeah. But what, <laughs> what Keyboard Maestro does is lets you basically record different um, keyboard or mouse strokes into basically a macro. Um, so then you can... Uh, do the same thing over and over again. So for example, I have a button that will uh, highlight a whole line by triple clicking and then do uh, command K to insert a link and then do command V to um, paste that link and then press enter to apply it and then press enter again to go down to the next line. And I can hmm. do all of those steps just with the press of one button. Uh, because you can link uh, Keyboard Maestro, your different shortcuts, into the Stream Deck. Um, you can use Keyboard Maestro by itself and just do uh, shortcuts. So you could have Command or Control, whatever, do different things. Um, but I've found that the uh, 
Stream Deck just looks cuter because also you can, on the version I got, you can customize all the little buttons and add different pictures and make them different colors. And uh, it, it's really fun. So that is what I have been doing. Um, and it, I do believe it has actually saved me a good chunk of time in uh, repetitive tasks. Very nice. Well, I can I'm very imagine. jealous. <laughs> Very jealous. Um, I've looked at those before and thought, boy, that would be, I could make good use of the uh, Stream Deck. I use Keyboard Maestro all the time. In fact, Keyboard Maestro has saved me hours and hours. Uh, some of you know that I do the narration for the Through My Bible in Three Years series, and we're redoing the whole thing. And I'm just coming up on a year's worth right now. I uh, just actually finished that today. And uh, one part of that is actually taking the text from the EHV, which is what we're now reading it in or narrating it in, and getting that into a WordPress blog, which is you could cut and paste that because I cut and pasted it from uh, Bible Gateway, but it's super ugly and the, the footnotes are all off and it does not come through well at all. So I've created a keyboard maestro action, which is probably about 50 items, 50 lines long, where it starts in WordPress, it knows where to put in the date and the, the Bible reference, I just have to put that into a simple form. And then it actually goes out to Bible Gateway, screen scrapes the exact reference, formats the footnotes, brings it in. And it. I think I timed it, it would take me about 12 minutes to do it by hand. And it takes me 30 seconds to do it with Keyboard Maestro. Now, it probably took me three or four hours to get Keyboard Maestro to where it needed to be. But boy, that's a super, super time saver. So um, I did look it up, Rachel. Auto Hotkey is the, actually was one of my picks of the week uh, last year. It's kind of the same thing for Windows. I don't think it's quite as full featured, but uh, it, it comes pretty close. And it's uh, if you're looking for some keyboard automation. That's the one I would recommend on the Windows side. It's an open source one. Keyboard Maestro is a paid for tool. I forget what the cost is, it but is. It's, yeah. not, so like it's not super expensive. Something. I just yeah. looked. Yeah. It was $36 as yeah. I was looking at the website. Not, not so. super bad, especially if you've got some good uses for it. But uh, Oh, it's worth the $36. <laughs> yeah, yep, for sure. So yeah, but that Stream Deck, uh, there's a Stream Deck Plus, I think as well, or you know, or premium or something that has a lot more buttons. And uh, a lot of people use that if they do a lot of video editing or things that are mm -hmm. often repetitive. So, you know, cut and splice and, you know, that kind of stuff that just, it helps to kind of have one hand on the mouse and one hand on the, on the stream deck just to, to yeah. make things go a little bit faster. So, and plus it, the cool factors there too. With the yeah. smaller one, you can have different pages of oh, right, icons. Right. So depend like if you fill this one up, you can have it like based on a certain application or or things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. If I got that, I'd have to get a new car because mine does not start with the with a key press. <laughs> so <laughs> that is a very useless and ridiculous feature. <laughs> but when I realized that that integration was there, I just had to try it. Oh, for sure. <laughs> And you can and pick totally the uh, you can put the i you can pick your icon for the button too, right? Because it's yep. it's an LED behind it or a screen behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Very, Very cool. Very nice. I can imagine you'll be filling up all those options as you begin work on that dissertation writing. There'll be some repetitive tasks there to get things formatted. Yeah. If there exactly. were only a button to do that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you write me a keyboard maestro script to just write the whole thing? <laughs> to write a dissertation. That'd yeah. be really helpful. Uh -huh. I could sell that. Yeah. All right, Sally, you're up. All right. Lots of geeking out here, but mine's super simple. My pick of the week is a little utility free download, um, open source, runs under GNU, GNU public license, and it's called Notepad++. Um, many of you are familiar that uh, Windows and Macs come probably with a built-in um, text editor, just really straightforward, clean, simple text editor, not all the bells and whistles of something like Microsoft Word or even Google Docs. It's just pure text. Um, Notepad++ is that, um, but it does so much more. And I guess 
in very simple terms, one of the things I like most about it is that it auto saves what I'm working on. So the next time I open it, whatever I left open when I closed it is automatically there. I don't have to name it or anything. I certainly can if I want to, but it takes care of holding on to whatever it has, um, saving it for me. And so I can come right back to where I left off. Uh, another very simple and wonderful feature is that it has tabs. So you can have more than one thing. Sometimes I have 20 of those tabs open where I'm working on different things. It's just a really great dumping ground. It's really clean and distraction free. And it has a lot more advanced features, especially programmer types might take advantage of where, um, code syntax and things like that can show up depending on the file type opens all kinds of file types while I'm speaking about it. And um, I've just found it to be kind of my best friend in my pocket utility. We've talked about it for before on the podcast. I think it was way back in 2017, the last time we made mention. So I thought it was worth bringing up something I use day in and day out. I install it on every computer work or personal so that it's just a really simple place for me to to copy and paste things and write things uh, quickly and easily know that they're going to be there when I open it again. So in my notepad plus plus, I actually keep a few tabs of just some basic things that I make use of. For instance, some code or formatted text that I use in Trello when I'm starting a new user story for um, a Trello card or that kind of thing. Um, notepad plus plus is just there for me all the time, holding that and waiting for me to make use of it. So can't say enough good about it. It's uh, simple and foundational for me and versatile. So I guess it kind of fits with our, our mm -hmm. Elastigirl theme. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure educators could find a use for it. So check it out. Notepad++ free download. I'll have a link in the show notes. A lot of people use tools like that, Sally, also, and maybe you mentioned this, is um, for distraction-free writing. Mm -hmm. So they don't want the all the, the Chrome around Word or, you know, Google Docs that distracts, you know, the bolds and the italics and the bullets and whatever. They just want to write and they don't want any distractions. And tools like this uh, really help you do that. And then you can worry about the formatting and all that other stuff when it gets closer to production time. But uh, right. tools like this are awesome. And most of them, I think, support uh, Markdown. Um, which we've talked about in the past. So you can do a little bit of formatting, you know, on the fly, but your, your hands are always on the keyboard. So you're not being distracted. So mm -hmm. good pick. Yeah, and one more thing I thought of was that um, it's a really great place to copy text from something that's mm -hmm. more bells and whistles, like strip it down to its bare minimum. And especially if you're going to paste that text into yeah, something to webify it, because yeah. you want to get rid of all of that extra and just format it yourself, especially in a web type scenario, like in a WordPress or whatever. Yep. Very good. All right. My pick of the week um, actually is kind of related to screencasting. It's uh, Windows only, but it's called Zoom It. It's been around for actually a long time. It's version 6.11 right now. But basically, it is a uh, screen magnification tool for Windows. And it actually does quite a bit more than that. But uh, with a simple key combination, you can zoom in by whatever percent you want. And this is great if you're teaching in class and doing a demonstration and, you know, the text is kind of small and you want to get people, you know, a little bit uh, better view of what, uh, what you want to show them. But not only can you zoom in, but it'll obviously follow your mouse around the screen and zoom in, you know, wherever it is that you want. But it'll also allow you to annotate. So you can do uh, rectangular annotations, free form. You can type in text. You can save the annotations later with the click of a button. You can get rid of the annotation or, or clear the annotation. Um, just a lot of useful tools, all keyboard sh shortcuts. Um, and you can change your color of your pen, draw straight lines, ellipses, uh, arrows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can output it to a PNG to, to save for later. There's a countdown timer if you want to use that in your class, those kinds of things. 
Um, a lot of people use the magnification tool that's built into Windows, which I have never liked, and I don't think <laughs> it's well designed and overly useful. Uh, this is a free uh, tool; it just sits in your your system tray. You bring it up with your keyboard shortcut, and away you go. It's a super small download, um, made by Mark Rosinovich, which is, who is a Microsoft employee and uh, author of some good science fiction stuff as well. Um, so it's, uh, battle tested and I think works really well if that's what you're, that's what you're after. It's part of this, uh, tool set called sys internals. Most of these are more for programmers or people trying to debug their windows systems. Um, but this is a little tool that he threw in there for, uh, for this express purpose. Cause it was a problem that he didn't like the solution for that was out there. So he built his own. So open source and available for anybody who wants to do any screen magnification. So zoom it. You guys are just way more coordinated than me. Remembering all the keystrokes and the buttons and everything, starting your car. I'm, I'm dumbfounded. <laughs> you need a stream deck because it's it, the, the little car icon. is going to be right on the button. It's very hard to mess. <laughs> You'll never forget it. You can it. even label the buttons with text oh that is too tiny to read. So right. <laughs> it's got it all. All right. <laughs> we should probably, well, we've got a long show today. Um, community news and feedback, Sally. Who's talking to yeah. us or what did we find out there? And we can be pretty quick with these because I think perhaps all three of these items we've mentioned on the show before. Um, but I did want to make mention of uh, the fact that Computer Science Education Week is coming up. We're talking ed tech and uh, it's just around the corner. So worth repeating, December 5th through 11th. Um, the highlight of that oftentimes is Hour of Code. And there are a plethora of Hour of Code activities out there that you can make, up, make use of just for an hour with your students sometime during that week. Um, they have it arranged by different grade levels. Uh, NASA's got a new space jam where you can learn about music and astronomy and coding all in one. Um, they have a popular uh, dance party uh, coding activity and it's been around for a while but it's all new this year with uh, lots of cool updates and if you don't find what you're looking for in the hour of code um, Google has their own ed ed computer science education week page organized with different um, activities there. I'm really interested in this code, a joke telling talk bot. That sounds like a fun activity. And I have a husband who very recently has taken up interest in dad jokes and I'm hearing a lot oh, of them. Dear. So <laughs> maybe he needs a joke telling talk bot. Who knows? Um, sounds like fun. So yeah. And if you're not a teacher or a student who wants to take advantage of Hour of Code, how about if you're just like me and these look pretty cool and would give you a little exposure to different computer science concepts, you can go do these as well. Maybe do the second grade ones if you're afraid, but check it out. I think it could be a fun time and they, they put a lot of effort into a lot of neat things that teach you about coding concepts. Um, I think on the dance party one, actually, there's an un plugged version. So you don't even have to code on your computer. You can uh, use it in the classroom without students using computers even. So um, lots of fun stuff here. Just wanted to give you that reminder. Um, moving on, uh, this week we had a question from someone looking for Christian Worship 2021. Uh, the new hymnal in Google lectionary format. Um, and we have talked about that recently, but wanted to just mention again, the new church year starts very soon and you can actually get that um, format available to you and copy it to your own calendar or click the button in the lower right and subscribe to this calendar and have it integrated. Um, this is free. It's for anyone. So you could share this link with your choir directors, your organist, your worship plan planning team, and they can make use of that. And this is um, kind of by popular demand. And the fact is, um, we also continued the Christian Worship 93, the old red hymnals, uh, Google lectionary calendar, which has been around for a long time. And we kind of thought it was about time to sunset that, but we had 
many people request um, that we continue it. And so we have. And year A that starts very soon with um, Advent 1 is available for Christian Worship 93 as well. So um, if you need those links, check out wellstech.wells.net. We'll post them out there and uh, you can make use of these with your worship planning. And then lastly, um, just one quick plug for Wells National Lutheran, I'm sorry, Wells National Conference on Lutheran Leadership. Easy for me to say. It's happening January 16th through 18th at the Hilton in Chicago, Illinois. And there's still room for you to register. Um, a huge lineup of all kinds of amazing speakers. Um, hat tip to our interview coming up very soon on Wells Tech. We're going to be talking to one of the speakers from the conference. And um, there are many, many here. If you try to choose, which I recently did, because I'm going to be there. And it's a hard job to try to choose which of the different speakers to hear. Um, the, the thing is, they have special pricing right now. So if you register before um, November 24th, so through the end of November 23rd, right up to Thanksgiving, you can get in for $249 per person. Um, and after um, the 23rd on Thanksgiving Day, the price jumps to $299 per person. Um, they've booked a really large venue, so they can host a lot of people at this conference. And um provided just an amazing uh, list of things to take part in. So you definitely want to check this out. I'm excited because my congregation is sponsoring um, people to attend and, and we kind of shared among each other who's taking which classes um, our breakout sessions. And so we have them all covered or the ones that are of real interest to us because there are so many options. So maybe you want to coordinate that within your congregation. I think there's an extra discount involved if you have more than three people attend from your congregation. They give you a little bit of a rebate after after you're registered. And so lots of incentive to be a part of this conference again, happening January 16th through 18th at the Chicago Hilton. So hope to see you there. Ellie, maybe if we can work it out, we should do a uh, Wells Tech recording there. So. Hey, that would be a lot of fun. Wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you teased it, so you might as well uh, go the whole mile and tell us what's coming up the next time. Oh, we're actually talking about some with someone who's speaking at the National Conference on Lutheran Leadership. Uh, Wendy Krieger is uh, doing a presentation on communication planning, a topic that we all can um, can learn from, obviously. So we wanted to hear a little bit about what she'll be presenting. Hopefully she'll share some of the nuggets. I'm sure it's better in person though, but we're looking forward to talking to Wendy and bringing you that interview on our next Wells Tech coming up in just a couple of weeks. Very nice. All right, that's gonna about do it. Rachel, thank you so much for your willingness to join us. And um, Thanks to you. I've got another thing to add to my Christmas wish list and uh, we'll see what happens. I got mine for my birthday. So ah, okay. Well, Christmas it is a is good present. It's a it good is. present idea. Excellent. Uh, but thank you. Appreciate your time and your ministry here at welcome. Martin Luther College. Good luck on your dissertation. Blessings on that. Uh, Sally, thank you for all you do. And uh, a special thanks to all of our listeners out there. We do this show for you and hopefully there's a blessing uh, for you in it. And uh, get back to us with uh, show ideas, uh, potential people that maybe we should interview, uh, opportunities for um, different topics on the show. We'd love to hear from you. So go to wellstech.wells.net and let us know. Thanks, everybody. We will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.